Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch and a good poster session. It is my pleasure to introduce the next and last keynote speaker, Shimon Watson. So Shimon is a colleague from uh, Computer Science. He's professor uh, at the Department of Computer Science here in Oxford. We've been talking for the past 10 years about RL, RL in control. It's been uh, always a pleasure. He's a person that understands uh, what's done on the other side. And uh, um, before Oxford, he was for a decade uh, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, as a faculty member. And he got educated at uh, UT Austin. Uh, today, however, he'll be wearing another hat, which is uh, that of a senior research scientist, I think, uh, at uh, Waymo. So uh, Shimon is a person that was able to transfer his research um, on uh, um, inverse reinforcement learning, mutation learning, uh, um, and also base adaptive uh, reinforcement learning, which is a topic that I find particularly enticing, um, on to real world application. He um, uh, created a spin out uh, called the latent logic that was uh, uh, successfully acquired by Waymo. And he'll be talking uh, a little bit about um, these uh, practical applications of reinforcement learning. So the title of uh, the um, Keynote is efficient and realistic simulation for autonomous driving. Please uh, join me to welcome Shimon. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, um, thank you Alessandro for that introduction and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. It's a pleasure to be here and to have the chance to tell you about some of the work that my team at Waymo has been doing on um, efficient and realistic simulation for autonomous driving. So um, let's get started. So I'm gonna start by um, giving some background about autonomous driving simulation. What is it and why is it important? Then I'm gonna talk about Symphony, which is a parallel and hierarchical framework for simulation. Then I'll talk about how we can extend these approaches to more robust and flexible latent hierarchies. And finally, I'll discuss some new work that hasn't even been published yet about using diffusion models for the tricky case of simulating in-conflict behavior. So let's start at the beginning with some background about autonomous driving simulation. So Waymo is an autonomous driving technology company. Its mission is to be the world's most trusted driver. Um, as you may know, Waymo started back in 2009 as the Google self-driving car project. Um, it now offers a fully autonomous ride-hailing service called Waymo One in multiple cities. Over the years, uh, Waymo cars have driven millions of miles on public roads and billions of miles in simulation. They've also driven in more than 13 states across uh, the US. So now it's the world's most experienced driver. In Phoenix and San Francisco, anyone can download the Waymo One app and use it to ride with the Waymo driver across our extensive uh, service territory. In Los Angeles, we're also serving autonomous trips as our service area gradually expands. And now Waymo has begun expansion to a fourth city, Austin, Texas. So, um, I think a lot of people have the impression that autonomous driving is still something for the distant future, um, or it's something that uh, never panned out. But um, the technology works, the technology is here today, and the process of scaling it up is already well underway. Okay, now the millions of miles of real data that Waymo has collected might seem like a lot, but it's not nearly enough to validate the Waymo driver in a scalable and repeatable way. So we need simulation tools to give engineers feedback during development, um, to test how our driver handles rare and safety critical situations, to discover novel issues that weren't observed in the data, and to validate software updates. So that's why at Waymo we're building the world's most experienced simulator, so we can safely and scalably test the Waymo driver. Now, one of the biggest challenges in building a simulator with the requisite fidelity and robustness is modeling the behavior of the other road users. 
the human drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians who share the roads with our cars. And this is where a key role for machine learning comes in, in particular imitation learning, because it gives us a powerful tool for extracting these behavior models from the millions of miles of real-world data that we have. Okay, now the first thing to understand is that even in simulation, everything starts with data. It's not just that the agents in the simulator are trained from data using imitation learning, though of course they are. It's also that the unfolding of the simulation itself is data-driven. So every simulation rollout is paired with a real-world run segment, like the one shown uh, there on the left. So a run segment is basically a joint trajectory consisting of log states that were recorded by the Waymo car out on the road, as well as other details like traffic light states, road layout information, and so on. Now, the rollout begins by placing the Waymo driver in the same initial state as the Waymo car was in at the beginning of the run segment and also spawning an agent at the initial state of each of the other road users in the scene. Then, as the simulation unfolds, the Waymo driver diverges from the log behavior because it's controlled by different software than was used when the data was collected. Right. Okay, so a naive approach to modeling the other agents in such a setting would be to just continue to refer to the log. In other words, just replay each agent's log behavior. Now, the example shown here show, makes clear why this is inadequate. So the real-world driver was in the state represented by the green box when it observed the objects in the pink boxes. The simulated behavior of a new version of the software is shown in blue. So prior to this point in the simulation, it performed slightly different actions, which caused it to diverge from the green box and arrive at the intersection slightly later. Now, because the agent coming from the right is just replaying the log, it doesn't react to the changed behavior of our driver and its left turn, which was innocuous in the real world, becomes a simulated but unrealistic collision. So to do better, we need these agents to react realistically when our driver takes a different course of action than in the log. This requires closed loop control policies, which we can learn via imitation. So the main idea is to treat our real data as a set of demonstration trajectories and then use imitation learning to synthesize models of human road behavior, which we call sim agent policies. So we can model this problem, the problem of how sim agents should react to a simulated Waymo driver, as a Markov game with an unknown reward function. We have available a data set of joint demonstration trajectories produced by the experts, that is the human drivers whose behavior we want to imitate. And the states in these trajectories are inferred from LIDAR and camera sensor readings on the Ego vehicle, that is the Waymo car that was used to collect the data that was then processed by Waymo's perception systems. Now the resulting state estimates have three kinds of features. First we have static features, like the locations of lanes and sidewalks and information about what we call the road graph, which is like a set of interconnected lane regions we have ancestor, descendant, and neighbor relationships. It describes how agents can move, change lanes, and turn. Second, we have dynamic uh, scene features like traffic light states. And then finally, we have agent features, the position, velocity, orientation of the other road users in the scene. Now, as I said, the simulation is data-driven, so it's based on a logged reference trajectory, and it's populated with some combination of playback agents that just replay the log, and interactive agents that execute these closed loop control policies that we want to learn from imitation. Okay, so with that in mind, let's turn to our Symphony framework for parallel hierarchical simulation. Now, at the core of Symphony is a standard imitation learning algorithm like behavioral cloning or Gale. So, behavioral cloning solves a supervised learning problem. A set of demonstration trajectories, in our case collected by observing human road users, is interpreted as a labeled training set, and a policy pi is trained to predict an action A given state S. So if we take a maximum likelihood approach, we get the equation shown here. Now, since uh, behavioral cloning optimizes only the conditional policy probabilities, 
It does not ensure that the underlying distribution of states visited by the learned policy matches those of the expert. So this can lead to what's called covariate shift and compounding errors. So small errors in the learned policy cause the agent to um, travel to unfamiliar states. In those unfamiliar states, it uh, tends to make even larger errors, and its uh, path diverges from that of the expert. So an alternative to behavioral cloning is a generative adversarial imitation learning, or GALE, which is one of many methods that improve on behavioral cloning um, by learning not just from the demonstrations, but by actually interacting with the environment. So Gale borrows ideas from GANs, and it employs a discriminator D that is trained to distinguish between states and actions generated by the agents from those in the demonstration data. So the discriminator is then used as a cost function by the policy learner, yielding increasingly log-like behavior. So this results in the minimax optimization problem shown here, where the discriminator is trying to distinguish between log and agent behavior, and the agent is trying to act in a way that will fool the discriminator. Now, if the underlying transition function is both known and differentiable, then we can push gradients through that transition function, and that allows us to update the agent's policy directly, instead of using a higher variance score function estimator, as we would typically do with Gale, relying on something like a, a policy gradient reinforcement learning algorithm. So this leads to a variant uh, of Gale called model-based Gale or M-Gale. Okay, so on top of these core imitation learning algorithms, Symphony contributes two uh, additional pieces. First, we have a parallel beam search that refines policies on the fly by pruning the branches that are unfavorably evaluated by the discriminator. And this ensures that the simulation produces highly realistic behavior. Second, we take a hierarchical approach that factors the agent behavior into goal generation and goal conditioning. This allows us to produce agents whose behavior has diverse intents and to reproduce the full distribution of realistic behavior. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this uh, parallel beam search. Now, in a typical adversarial method like uh, Gale, the discriminator is used only during training. It's used as a cost function to train the policy, and then when the policy is trained, the discriminator is discarded. By contrast, in Symphony, we actually use the discriminator at test time. So we use it to shape the behavior during inference. And as we've seen again and again with methods like AlphaZero, when we have access to a model of the environment dynamics, combining a policy like, for example, represented as a neural network with online refinement using tree search is an, an incredibly powerful approach. But there's an important difference in our case. So in AlphaZero, as in traditional model predictive control methods, the agent will simulate various futures and then use the results of those simulations to decide on a single action to execute in the target environment. But in our setting, the simulator is itself the target environment. Um, so it is the domain in which we are deploying our agents. So simulating an action and executing an action are actually exactly the same thing. However, because the simulations happen in parallel, promising branches can be duplicated uh, during execution to replace the unpromising branches, and that allows us to focus our computation on the most realistic rollouts. So the way this works is we train the policy using behavioral cloning, or MGale, but when we perform simulations, we don't just sample actions from that policy, we perform a tree search online, and we prune the branches that are rated as unrealistic by our discriminator. So if we start with the initial state shown at the root, we can sample several actions from the agent's joint policy and then simulate forward several steps. We sample from the actions, apply the dynamics model at each step. Then for each branch, we compute a realism score between 0 and 1 by aggregating the discriminator outputs in some way. There are many ways that we could do this in our experiments. We take a max across the agents and across the last k time steps. So in other words, we're penalizing the rollouts for the least realistic uh, behavior that occurs in the rollout. Um, then we prune the least realistic simulations and resample from the most realistic ones, keeping the total number of parallel simulations constant. And then we repeat this process, pruning and resampling again and again. 
So here we can see the parallel beam search in action by visualizing all the parallel rollouts simultaneously. So the brighter shades indicate rollouts that are rated uh, as more realistic, and the darker shades, uh, the blue shades, indicate unrealistic behavior. So as expected, if you turn before or after the passing car, that's realistic. If you crash into the passing car, that's unrealistic. Now, um, we compared Symphony to baseline methods that don't employ this parallel beam search on a data set of over a million run segments. And the results show that beam search greatly reduces unrealistic behavior like collisions and off-road driving. Um, however, um, it's not all good news. Using the beam search hurts the simulator's distributional realism because it prunes away diversity. Um, so in the GAN literature, this is referred to as mode collapse. Um, so we can actually quantify this phenomenon using a diversity metric that we came up with called curvature Jensen-Shannon divergence. So what it does is it measures the difference between the simulated and the logged turning behaviors. More specifically, it's the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the empirical distributions of the average curvature of the simulation and reference logs. So if you consider a four-way simulation, like the one shown at the top there, where you can either turn left or turn right or go straight, we can quantify how often dra uh, drivers engage in each of those behaviors by computing for each branch point in the road graph the average curvature as drivers pass through the intersection. Now, if we repeat this process for a number of branch points and a number of intersections, we get an empirical distribution of the average curvature. And if we uh, compare these distributions in both simulation and in log, we can compute the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the two, and that gives us a, gives us a measure of distributional realism. Um, and as you can see, uh, using parallel beam search um, makes the, our um, distributional realism worse, as measured by this curvature JSD. Um, and if we actually look at the empirical distributions themselves, rather than just aggregating them um, with this divergence, as shown in the bottom right, then we can actually see the loss of diversity manifested as an underrepresentation of right turns. So they're on the, on the right-hand side of the graph. OK, now in order to address this loss of distributional realism, um, we're going to use a hierarchical approach. So we can recover the diversity that was pruned away by our parallel beam search by um, uh, introducing these hierarchical goal policies. So control of the agent is split between a goal generating policy and a goal conditional policy. So the goal generating policy is used to sample a goal conditioned only on the first state of the rollout. The goal then remains fixed throughout the rollout in order to model consistent intent on the part of the agent. The goal generating policy is then trained to match the empirical distribution of goals in the demonstration data. Now the goal conditional policy takes this goal, as well as the current state, as input and specifies the probability of the available actions. In addition, the discriminator also conditions on the goal so that it's evaluating realism in the context of the given intent. Now, in our setting, goals are represented as sequences of road graph segments um, because what these sequences constitute are routes. And these routes capture high-level intent of the agent. Uh, they are a primary source of multimodality, so if we want to capture distributional realism, we want to capture those multiple modes, we want a notion of, in, of intents that correlates with that multimodality. Okay, so the figure on the left uh, sort of summarizes the symphony setup. We have our goal-generating policy shown in orange. It samples a goal conditioned on the first state of the rollout, which then remains fixed. Now, the goal conditional policy, shown in green, it takes this goal and the current state as input. And then during execution, rollouts are performed in parallel by sampling actions from the goal conditional policy and refining them on the fly using our parallel beam search. So combining the parallel beam search with the hierarchical approach enables us to get the best of both worlds. Um, as we can see um, in the uh, bar graph on the right, we can retain the realism of beam search, but also greatly improve distributional realism, as measured again by this curvature Jensen-Shannon divergence, recovering the diversity that was pruned away by the tree search and more. 
Okay, so now I'd like to move on to the second topic, what we call robust type conditioning. Um, so we're going to take this idea of hierarchical SIM agents um, even further. Uh, and this new method, robust type conditioning, it's going to make use of latent hierarchies. So in the approach I described so far, we have hierarchical policies, but the notion of goal is something which is not latent. It's something which is explicit. So we can actually look at the logs. We can infer the goal as we defined it by extracting the sequence of road segments that were visited by the agent in that log. So the goal is something which is explicitly observed uh, when we record the data. But now we want to broaden our notion of intent to include things that uh, uh, affect the agent's behavior at a high level, but which might be latent, which are not directly observable in the log. Um, right. So if we want our, our simulated agents to be truly realistic, we need to go beyond these road graph goals. We want to model more than the path that the agent intends to follow. We also want to capture these latent aspects of the, of the agent's persona. So for example, some agents are more aggressive than others. Um, they have various differences in their driving style. We would like to model these with our hierarchical approach. In addition, we also want to be able to model agents that don't always follow road graphs. So the most obvious example here are pedestrians. Pedestrians are very important um, road users from the perspective of an autonomous vehicle for obvious safety reasons. Um, but we cannot model their intent using a sequence of road graph segments because usually they're not even in the road. Uh, when they do, they're often crossing it in a perpendicular way. They often go, uh, go off the road. So um, the question then is, can we learn a better goal representation than this road graph, uh, sequence of road graph segments that we manually define? Uh, so we want to learn these latent goals, but doing so is difficult for a fundamental reason, which is that the behavior that we observe in our demonstration trajectories combines two different sources of information. So it combines both goal-directed actions with reactions to stochastic events that were triggered by other agents or the environment. So we have a latent confounder consisting of this reactive behavior. So for example, imagine we are this like blue car at the bottom. We have all these demonstration trajectories, and they all consist of an agent approaching the intersection with the intention of turning left. But in some of the demonstrations, this agent stops at a red light, and in other demonstrations, it proceeds through a green light. So the observed behavior results from a combination of both the goal of turning left and the reaction to the stochastic state of the traffic light. So if we want to properly infer the agent's latent intent, we need to tease these two factors apart. So the underlying problem here can be characterized as a distribution sh shift that occurs between training and testing. So during training, we know the future because we have the demonstration trajectory available to us to train with. So the trajectory contains both past, present, and future actions. Now we can encode this trajectory uh, and infer a latent goal from it. Then we can then decode that latent goal by rolling out a generated trajectory. During training, we can then minimize an imitation loss that, prior, that penalizes the discrepancy between the demonstration trajectory and the generated ones. It's basically a reconstruction loss. So that's the setup during training. However, during testing, we don't have a demonstration trajectory to encode. So we have to sample the latent goal from a learned prior. And then we decode that sampled latent goal to roll out the generated trajectories. And it's the difference between these two settings which is the cause of our problems. So let's look at the traffic light example again in more detail. Suppose we have a bunch of demonstration trajectories where the agent always wants to turn left. In some of the demonstrations, it waits at a red light. In, in other demonstrations, it uh, proceeds at green. So now during training, we want to learn to encode and decode these trajectories. The learned latent representation that results from this training process will naturally include the state of the traffic light. Because encoding the state of the traffic light is helpful when you need to decode to roll out trajectories that match the corresponding demonstration. You need to predict the future log, and the state of the traffic light is obviously helpful in predicting. Is the future log going to stop at the intersection or proceed? Okay. The problem is, at test time, the agent doesn't have the demonstration trajectory, so it needs to sample goals from our learned prior. 
this yields stop and go behavior in proportions that match that in the training data. So the agent's behavior is in that sense realistic. However, the agent doesn't have the power to sample the corresponding traffic light behavior because traffic lights are not a part of the agent. They just vary stochastically in a way that, that the agent cannot control. So what we get is behavior where sometimes the stopping behavior fortuitously aligns with a red light and the go behavior aligns with a green light. But we also sometimes will see the opposite with the agent stopping at a green light or even worse, uh, proceeding through a red light. So um, existing methods that learn these latent hierarchical goals for um, simulation in autonomous vehicles, they basically assume a deterministic environment. So they sidestep this problem. But if we want agents that can behave properly in stochastic environments, which is a crucial requirement, we have to address this issue. Okay, so to avoid these inappropriate reactions to the environment, our learned latent goals should only determine actions that are under the agent's control, such as uh, when, to, when and where to turn, but not their reactions to the environment, for example, whether to stop at a traffic light. So how do we disentangle these two during training? We want to learn a policy that produces realistic trajectories, regardless of what goal is sampled at test time. And this is only possible if the goals don't overdetermine the agent's behavior. But it's not, it's not straightforward to train a policy to this end because in each segment we only know the agent's expert behavior for the inferred goal, not for every possible goal that could have occurred in that situation. So a pure imitation loss is not going to be sufficient. We just don't have in the data the examples needed to learn in that fashion. So instead we're going to combine two training objectives. For the goal inferred from the future trajectory, we optimize the agent to follow the log trajectory, thereby training it to follow goals. For the randomly sampled goals, we optimize the agent to behave realistically according to a learned discriminator, just like in Gale. Because the agent doesn't know whether the current girl goal is inferred or random, it will learn to follow it as much as possible, but only insofar as its behavior remains realistic, as determined by this learned discriminator. Okay, so this is the full algorithm shown schematically at the top and um, as a combined loss function at the bottom. So for each segment sampled from our data set, we infer a latent goal, a GE, that's the orange encoder. We roll it out using a policy, which is shown in green, and we optimize the policy and encoder to reconstruct, that is to imitate the log trajectory. Now for random goals sampled from our prior, shown in blue, we apply the purple Adversarial discriminator loss, which optimizes realism. Now, for simplicity, this adversarial loss is also applied to trajectories from inferred goals, but this is not crucial to the algorithm. Now, lastly, we have an additional KL divergence loss between the goals proposed by the prior and those inferred by the encoder. So this loss, as in variational autoencoders, trains the prior to predict distributionally realistic goals, and it also regularizes the encoder. This is important to make sure that it is indistinguishable for the agent whether goals are coming from the prior or from the encoder. Okay. So uh, to evaluate this method, robust type conditioning, we use the Waymo open motion data set consisting of 487,000 segments of real world driving. In addition to the collision rate, the off-road time, and the curvature Jensen-Shannon divergence that we talked about before, we also have the minimum average displacement error, or min ADE, which is a standard metric used in behavior prediction. And we have a new distributional realism metric called progress JSD. So this measures the difference between the distributions, it measures the difference between the distributions of the distances traveled in the demonstration and agent trajectories. So this is like curvature JSD, but instead of looking at the curvature, we look at the distance traveled. And this is useful because the agent's progress correlates with its driving persona. So more aggressive agents will tend to make progress more quickly. Now, two implementations of robust type conditioning, one with continuous latent variables and the other with discrete uh, latent variables, both improve task performance over the competing methods by better avoiding unrealistic trajectories. So this is especially clear if we compare it to the naive hierarchical approach which has nearly an order of magnitude more collisions because um, 
It doesn't address this distribution shift that I talked about. At training time, the inferred type contains too much information, such as, what, for example, when to brake and when to start driving. So at test time, when this information is sampled independently of what's actually happening, uh, the agent behaves incorrectly and tends to collide with other road users. Now, robust type conditioning also uh, improves in terms of distributional realism. So while Symphony does well in terms of curvature JSD, as we saw earlier, because the road graph goals um, capture driving intent with these sort of routes, uh, Symphony does poorly on progress JSD, which measures driving style, because we haven't captured that latent intent, uh, which is another uh, crucial part of the agent's high level. Okay, um, this brings me to my final topic, which is about using diffusion models to simulate in-conflict behavior. This is uh, some really recent work, hot off the presses. Actually, it isn't, it isn't off the presses because there isn't even a paper about it yet. Um, but I'm excited to have the chance to tell you a little bit about it today. Um, so this project aims to tackle the key challenge of what I like to call agent tail realism. So the hierarchical agents that I told you about so far, at best, what they do is capture all of the modes uh, in the distribution. So that is, they are able to reproduce all of the realistic common behaviors displayed by human road users. But they still won't capture the tails of those distributions because that tail behavior doesn't appear often enough in our data. Even with millions of miles of data, these tail events uh, don't appear often enough if they appear at all. Um, in addition, our distributional metrics, they aren't sensitive enough to flag these omissions for exactly the same reason. So these distributional metrics, at the end of the day, they're comparing the learned behavior to the log behavior. So if these tail events aren't in the log behavior, then failure to reproduce the tail events um, won't result in a penalty in terms of these distributional realism metrics. They're just not sensitive enough. So this is a really crucial limitation because simulating tail behavior is a fundamental requirement for autonomous driving simulation. Um, so the reason for this is probably obvious. It's exactly these rare events, like collisions and the conflict situations that can potentially give rise to collisions, that we need to be able to simulate and we need to be able to simulate them well. So we need to be able to push our simulation from the realistic common behaviors at the center of the circle into the realistic conflict behavior shown in the blue donut. But at the same time, we can't uh, go too far and start generating the unrealistic behaviors on the outside of the donut. So the key challenge of agent tail realism is how can we sample from the donut? So to address this challenge, we need to build a sim agent model which is controllable via a set of inference time constraints. These constraints allow us to model conflict scenarios by enforcing delays in the agent's reaction time so delays in the agent's reaction to the behavior of the autonomous vehicle, um, which will trigger these, these conflicts that we're interested in. But at the same time, ensuring realism by requiring the agent to try to avoid collisions, try to avoid driving off the road, and obey a set of dynamic constraints on the agent's longitudinal and lat lateral accelerations. Okay. Now, a powerful approach to implementing such a model is to use diffusion. So, uh, as you may know, diffusion models are trained by taking data, like the image shown here on the right, and repeatedly diffusing it by adding Gaussian noise, and then training a denoiser that iteratively removes this noise to recover the original image. New samples can then be generated at test time by starting from an image containing Gaussian noise and repeatedly denoising it. So while this example contains vision data, diffusion models can also be trained to generate trajectories, such as those produced by sim agents. So some examples of trajectories being denoised are shown here at the bottom. Now, one of the really nice things about diffusion models is that it is easy to add constraints on the generated behavior at inference time, even if the model had no knowledge of such constraints during training, by simply adding terms to the gradient followed by the denoiser. So in this way, we can use reaction constraints to guide diffusion towards generating conflict behavior while using collision, off-road, and dynamic constraints to ensure the resulting behavior remains realistic. So in this way, we um, can hope to sample successfully from the donut. 
So another nice feature of diffusion is that it gives us an extra dimension we can use to trade off log following agent behavior with reactive agent behavior. Now earlier I told you that simply following the log isn't good enough and that we need reactive agents. And that's true, but it's a bit um, oversimplified. We also don't want the pendulum to swing too far the other way because if the agents completely ignore the log, which after all was generated by real human road users, they're more at risk of behaving unrealistically. And even if they remain realistic, they may not remain true to the spirit of the log, and thus not, they may not recreate what made that log interesting. So for many use cases, what we actually need to do is hit a sweet spot between log following and reactivity. And we can do that by choosing what we call the hot starting step. So with hot starting at inference time, we don't start denoising from random noise, but instead from the log trajectory. And if the hot starting step is k, then for the first k steps of denoising, the trajectory is fixed to the log. For example, suppose during training we denoise for 128 steps, and then at inference time we set our hot starting step to be 64. Then for the first 64 denoising steps, we keep the trajectory fixed at the log. And for the latter 64 denoising steps, we update it by following the denoising gradient. So we can see the effect of this um, uh, in the plot shown here. So as the hot starting step moves later, we become more log following. We can see this by, by, by the falling rate of min ADE, because this is a measure of the agent's displacement relative to the log. However, we also become less reactive, which we can see um, manifested in an increasing collision rate. So by choosing a suitable hot starting step, we can balance these factors appropriately. Okay, let's take a closer look at the inference time constraints that we apply to our diffusion model. For each logged run segment, we can either manually or automatically identify the time step T when the reacting agent first observes evidence of an emerging conflict. We then sample a value R from a response time model to determine how much delay will occur between the onset of the conflict and the agent's reaction. Then, during the interval between T and T plus R, we simulate unreactive behavior by constraining the agent to follow the log. Then, starting at time step T plus R, the agent is controlled by the diffusion model using the collision, off-road, and dynamic constraints, which I'll describe in a minute. And in this phase, the diffusion model is hot-started from the log to get the right balance between log following and reactivity. Okay, so one way that we enforce realism is with collision and off-road constraints. The collision constraints penalize the agent for crossing, crossing the path of another road user, and the off-road constraints penalize it for departing from the road graph. And here you can see how both of these costs can be included in the same cost map, which enables constant time gradient lookups. Um, but to generate realistic in conflict, uh, in conflict behavior, we also need constraints that ensure the agent's reactions are dynamically feasible. So we do this with a di convex dynamic constraint on the longitudinal and lateral accelerations. So the challenge here is that the model actually only outputs x, y positions, and the, harder, the higher order dynamics are hard to predict since we don't have any labels. Um, so we recover these using a rolling polynomial regression, and the figure here shows how the constrained denoising process gradually pushes the sample trajectory into the convex feasible region. Okay, so here we see an example of our diffusion model in action. This is a hypothetical scenario in which the um, autonomous vehicle in gray um, breaks suddenly while staging for a right turn. And it does so as it's in front of a tailgating vehicle shown in red. So we use the diffusion model to, to model the tailgater's react, uh, behavior in the, reactive behavior in this conflict situation. So um, in the figure, you can see all of the different trajectories that the diffusion model generates for the various sampled reaction times. Some of them successfully avoid a collision by reacting quickly enough to stop or swerve, while others do not. So these kind of simulations can be used to assess the safety of the autonomous vehicle stopping behavior. <clears throat> okay, um, before I wrap up, let me um, just mention a few of the remaining challenges that still need to be addressed. So the first of these is partial observability, 
which is currently not modeled by our agents uh, and gives rise to actually a number of different subtle issues. So first of all, perception errors in the data can confound the training process. So like imagine a car um, driving down a narrow road with cars parked on both sides. If you have even small errors estimating the size of the car's bounding box, then it will look like the car is crashing into all of these parked cars on the side of the road. Now, if you take this and treat it as an expert demonstration to learn from, you're basically teaching your sim agent that crashing into cars is a good thing to do. Um, so what we need is noise-aware imitation learning uh, methods that are robust to this sort of issue, that will like downweight demonstrations when we have higher um, perception uncertainty. Another issue with partial observability is that sometimes the log behavior that we observe may not actually be explainable without a model of the driver's partial observability. So for example, if the driver takes information gathering actions, like creeping forward in an intersection before turning in order to see around a building, this behavior doesn't make any sense unless you have a model of the occlusions that restrict the driver's observability. So to capture this kind of behavior, we need more sophisticated agents that actually reason about this kind of partial observability. And also, because the purpose of simulation is ultimately to model the real world from the perspective of the, of the self-driving car, we also have the challenge of what we call viewpoint sim that is recreating in simulation the partial observability, including the perception noise, that the vehicle would experience when it's out on the road. Okay, another challenge is adaptive importance sampling. Even once we've built a highly realistic simulator, we still have the problem of deciding how best to use it, how to make the most efficient use of our limited simulation budget. So this means we need to upsample the scenarios that are most likely to generate events of interest, like these conflict and collision scenarios. Um, I didn't have time to go into it today, but we had a paper at CORAL recently about training predictive models that can then in turn be used to define better proposal distributions uh, to sample from when you're simulating. But this yields a fixed proposal distribution, and it only upsamples at the level of run segments. So the next step is to make proposal distributions that are adaptive, so we actually use the results of the earlier simulations to decide what to prioritize in future simulations, um, and to um, to do the upsampling inside the simulation itself, not just when deciding on run segments to simulate. Um, so this means building adversarial agents that behave in a way that will trigger these conflicts, but in a realistic way, so that we make even more efficient use of simulations. And then finally, we have um, the challenge of co-training our sim agents with the planner that actually controls the, the autonomous vehicle itself. So having a simulator that's reliable enough to train the driver and not just to evaluate it is like the holy grail of autonomous driving simulation. There are huge potential benefits to doing this, but there are also challenges such as overfitting and sim to real transfer that require special care and attention. Um, now, if you're interested in getting your hands dirty with the challenges of autonomous driving, I encourage you to play around with some of Waymo's open data sets. There are a number of challenges you can participate in from perception to behavior prediction to planning. Um, especially relevant to what I discussed today is the Waymo Sim Agent Challenge. So in each segment in the data set, the task is to use the first second of data as agent history and then produce realistic Sim Agent behavior for the remaining eight seconds. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what I discussed today, please check out some of our publications listed here. The last paper here is the one that, that I didn't have time to go into, but which I mentioned uh, about important sampling for autonomous vehicle simulation. Um, this is also a great uh, opportunity for me to thank my many, many collaborators uh, shown here with the author lists, including members of my team at Waymo, members of other research teams at Waymo, members of production teams at Waymo that we collaborate with. Um, without their hard work, none of this would have been possible. Okay, thank you all for listening, and I would be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. I had a question regarding um, the behavior of the agents in general. So is, would there be, is, there, is it right to think that in this case, the agents would be Markovian? If you train them, like if you train policies via one of the methods, um, 
are they effectively Markovian or are they observing histories to decide on the next action to take, like in the simulation? Um, so uh, from the sim agent perspective, they are Markovian, um, but that's because they operate on the output of the perception. The perception system, which is an external module, which produces these state estimates for the agents, it uses the whole history. Yeah, yeah I was just interested, so um, this long tail of uh, you know unlikely conflict behavior and so on, like a lot of those situations are resolved by hand signals and facial expressions and these kinds of things. So I was wondering what fraction of the the training value comes from you know things which are not just kinematic models of the vehicles moving around. Yeah, um, that's that's a good question. Um, so, so two things about that. So first of all, perception teams at Waymo, which I am not involved with at all, they do a lot of hard work on this sort of thing. So it's not enough to like localize the pedestrians. You need to actually like recover their skeletal frame, figure out which way they're looking, what are, are, you know, which way they're gesturing, if they're gesturing. All of that is like super important information for the perception team to recover. Um, the sim agent problem as traditionally defined would not include that because basically, the way we define the problem is if we can realistically determine the x, y position uh, of, this, of every sim agent in the field, we're happy we've done our job. But as I mentioned, really the task is much bigger than that because the task I I includes viewpoint sim. So a more general way to think about it is like um, after the perception modules do their work, there's a bunch of messages that are sent from the perception module to the control system. And every field that, that um, uh, is contained in those messages needs to be simulated by the simulator. So this could be traffic light state, it could be you know, um, noisy signals ab about um, all kinds of objects in the environment, and it could be things like um, uh, position, gestures, facial expressions, and so on uh, of the road users. So if the perception system is producing that output and making it available to us, then making it available to the planner of the self-driving car, then the sim agents also need to be able to replicate it. And that's a much bigger mission. Um, the hope is that the techniques that we're using here uh, can be generalized. It's just basically adding dimensions to your predictive generative model. But obviously, um, th there are some tricky details there that need to be thought about. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, just like uh, uh, Mr. Sampat, but when I saw the table of the, the results, I saw the number 4.2. 23% of the collision, I was quite shocked to see the, the number. Is it correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the collision rate, rate is 4.23 uh, RTC C plus minus 0.16. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing to notice is if you look at the top line, um, the data distribution. So even if you exactly do what's in the data, you still get a collision rate above 1%. Um, and this is because there are perception errors in the data. Um, now, in, uh, like these experiments are on a smaller scale, but in other experiments that we've published uh, on larger data sets, we do get uh, collision rates that um, basically approach that floor. But yeah, I mean, what this points to is uh, the problem that I hinted at already, which is that metrics are really hard. So we had to invent curvature JSD and progress JSD. They are very imperfect metrics of uh, distributional realism. They don't model these tail events like I was talking about. And these, these um, realism metrics like collision and off-road, there are um, confounders uh, due to things like perception errors. So that, that always has to be um, taken into account. Yeah, um, so I guess I had a question about like sampling the donut and why we, what's preventing us from, or I guess the reason for not sampling the unrealistic behaviors, is that more of a metrics issue? Like we don't have good metrics for like blame or a 
causing collisions and things like that, or just like a data efficiency issue. Like it's just not worth it to sample them from like a cost standpoint. Um, it's both, but if we if we um, if we could reliably tell the difference in an automatic way between realistic and unrealistic tail behavior, um, but we couldn't generate it, so we had to like rely on some expensive rejection sampling, that would still be a huge improvement over today. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, automatically defining and detecting realism is really hard. Uh, it, it's, really, it's really hard in the tail, because you don't have ground truth to refer to. So this approach that we've taken here, it's like a combination of, of a data-driven approach with something, you know, expertise that comes from traffic experts, uh, you know, about these like dynamic constraints and reaction time modeling and so on. Um, that, that becomes a necessary ingredient because of the lack of data. Does that answer your question? A little bit. <laughs> this is more like, like if you could just sample like the unrealistic behaviors, but like, um, like, like the constraints in the planner and metrics you're tracking, like, like if you have like a constraint that said that like was a causal constraint on collision. Um, so even if like the agent did, even if like the other agents do something unrealistic, you still, the like autonomous agent still passes the constraint if there's a collision. Um, so like to like the planning algorithm, it doesn't really matter if the behavior is realistic or unrealistic. Um, that would that would basically let you like not really have to worry about sampling the unrealistic behavior, so it's not really a donut anymore. Um, but then there's like a trade-off is even if you had that metric, it is also just like computationally expensive to simulate the unrealistic behaviors. Um, so it's kind of a waste of computational resources. Yeah, so the, the, that, like, <laughs> sure that, there, there would definitely be a computational yeah. issue. But, but I, like what, what I'm saying is yeah. I would love to be in a situation where the computational bottleneck was the problem. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're not even at that stage. We're at the stage where um, telling the difference between the two is difficult. So I think what you're saying is that sometimes it doesn't matter if the behavior is unrealistic because it doesn't cause, causally uh, influence the outcome. Um, yeah, and I that is true. More of like the like, constraints we're like, putting in the motion planners were like, causal, then like, it might not really matter if the, how realistic the scenarios they're exposed to in simulation are. Um, but I, I don't really think those constraints really like, exist in like, clean forms yet. So. Sorry, why would it not matter? Because like, like if you just think of like an agent, like it wouldn't be like if you generate just like a random scenario, it like wouldn't be like penalized by the constraint violation if the other agent did something unrealistic if you like behave correctly in the situation. Like if you could define like a general constraint that defined like correct behavior just given sort of like Well uh, Okay, but one of the many fundamental trade offs in self driving is between progress and safety. Okay? So uh, in order to achieve safety, you have to, you have to um, give something up on progress. So if you, if you spend a lot of time achieving safety in unrealistic scenarios, you will give up too much progress. You know what I mean? You'll be too conservative. So, you know, if we simulate something and it generates a collision, we go, oh, shit, there's something wrong. We need to change the policy to avoid this kind of collision. Then it really, really matters whether that scenario is realistic or not. Because we don't, we don't want to take unnecessary safety measures to avoid stuff that wouldn't happen anyway. Obviously, in real life, it's not that binary. Like, everything has some non-zero probability, but some things are so unlikely that they're not worth uh, worrying about. Or how much you, worth, you, you worry about them is a function of how likely they are. And that's the, that's the situation we're, we're wrestling with. Um, there are absolutely, like, conflicts that are realistic, but that are not interesting because the ADV does not have causal control over the outcome. Um, but untangling the causality is at least as difficult as distinguishing between the donut and the, the outer part. And on this note on uh, safety and rare events, I suppose we can uh, thank again, Shimon. <laughs>